this side there's a floor. Isn't that cool? And there's the Royal Trade Center. By the time we got orders and stuff, banks were closed and such. And uh, I actually borrowed money from my young daughter who was 14 at the time that had babysitting money. And uh, uh, she, they, that afforded me to be able to have cash to go out and, and, and uh, uh, pay for my food, pay for taxis, you know, to and from the airport. Um, we're all volunteers, but we do get reimbursed. But that's not till after the fact. Um, and so we, we, I needed cash. And luckily she had saved enough of her money. She's so much like her mother, thank God. Uh, and she had saved probably about $850, you know, from babysitting. Pretty lucrative industry. Well, cottage industry. But uh, she, so even the youngest of the young did something that day to assist. Of course, now I have to say, uh, I did pay her back. There's three of us, uh, and it, it, I, I, I think we were just kind of overwhelmed by, by the, the serenity and the uniqueness of the still night on a major interstate. Um, we were nervous, we were frightened, we were scared, just like everybody else, not simply just for our mission, but for everybody. Uh, and uh, it was fairly quiet. It was, if you can imagine, myself and two other like kind people. Uh, it was it was a very serious ride down. Ooh, so we all came from all different corners of of the Midwest, and so we all headed home. And I'm sure everybody had the same thought in their mind. Darn it, you know, our opportunity to to to, to help. Well, and it wasn't until the next day that when I came, you know, that I came home, and it was early in the morning when we got home, uh, that I found found out that Karen Kincaid from Waverly, Iowa, was on the plane that hit the Pentagon, and then I was doubly crushed for her loss, for the sympathies that we had for their family. They, she just grew up down the street from us, she and her family, and then I really felt crushed that I couldn't go help because um, I had this living connection, if you will. Somebody that you know so far away be involved in such a catastrophe, a, devast a devastation is kind of envelops. And so everybody was visiting about it. Uh, um, uh, prayerfully concerned, you know, so it, it was kind of hard not to know, you know, when we got back and we started, and I started talking to my wife and visited about our evening and so forth. That's one of the first things that was mentioned, that uh, that Karen was on, was on the uh, was on the uh, uh, on the plane that uh, that uh, bombed the the uh, Pentagon. So then your mind really starts to wander. Oh my gosh, who else? What other ties are there? You know, but that was just for a fleeting moment, as I recall, because it didn't matter if we knew them or not, it had happened. Again, that moment where we all came together in kind of a very unique and special and unselfish way, all of us, everybody. You know, kids were afraid to go to school that day. Parents were not letting them go to school that day. Firefighters were devastated. They wanted to leave their post and run out to help put the fires out. Well, they knew that they had responsibilities here, and they couldn't. That's why it's so important that teams like this get put together. You know, um, we can't all do it because then there's nobody here to do what we need to do every day. What What does it take to do the job you did there? Psychologically, mentally. Uh, I think we all have the innate qualities to do it. I really do. And then you just go, what, what's your discipline? What's your passion? You know, you don't have to recreate yourself all the time. Oh, we wouldn't be able to do anything. You know, jack of all and expert of none, whatever that's called. No, you've got your discipline. If there's somebody that needs your discipline, you have the propensity, you have the innate qualities to 
lend that. Right? Oh, people say, where's God in all of this? Why couldn't he have done something? Well, there, I, have, I have two responses to that. Where was God? I saw him all over the place out there. God works through us. He's not an individual that I don't think says, I can do it all by myself. He says, no, what I'll do is give you the tools to do it. I saw him all over through the other, through people, through my daughter, through, through you, through everybody. And why, why couldn't God fix this? He did. He took care of it before it arose. That's how come we don't bury people. We just bury bodies. He was, he did take care of it. But that was a question. Why did God let this happen? He didn't let it happen. We let it happen. And and here's what happened. And and uh, without going into detail, we you know we've seen everything in the over and over and over and over again, which is which is okay because it's a lesson. Um, we all understand without too much graphic detail what can happen in, in an event like that. Uh, and so we go out prepared for the unexpected, prepared to be unprepared. It's a disaster. But at least we have some sort of uh, background that will help us. And yes, as a funeral director, you know, I, I, we saw death on a daily, bis uh, daily, uh, daily basis. But it's rare that you see 2,900 deaths all at the same time. So uh, all we did was work. Thus, no pictures. Thus, no stuff. We worked. Um, we, we did our job, and we were allowed to perform our duties. And, uh, yeah, we were able to work shoulder to shoulder with people that were wanting to work shoulder to shoulder with us. And we all understood our our role. Um, we, all, we all understood our disciplines. Um, and... Uh, we proved to the world that uh, the people in this part of the world, the people in the people of the United States are, are we come from good stock. We watch out for everybody. We help each other. Um, and we all came together to do the job that we all could do. And then uh, we left. And, uh, the work experience was very unique. Um, and we were working with... Uh, we were working with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> <coughs> crime scene investigators, detectives, Manhattan detectives, uh, CSI. I mean, these Pat and Louie, it was actually Louis, but he says, ah, oh, my mom and dad call me Louie, you call me Louie too. Okay, and these are young guys, young detectives, I mean, just like we would see, you know, th these are the real deal guys. And so we worked very closely because I was assigned to legal medical, working with identifying the anti-mortem, the information provided to us by the families of the suspected dead. Because they weren't dead until we could say, you know, until someone says indeed they were in that. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't go to Jamaica or they didn't, you know, run and hide. And then we had the post-mortem, the information gathered by the forensic scientists and, and, uh, and DMORT. And so once we put those two together, we could say, ah, uh, we, have, we have somebody uh, that did perish in that facility. And so then Louis and Patrick would investigate it like a crime scene. Those guys worked hard. And they were right there. They're from Manhattan. And so... As I said, we kind of waved in and out, you know. Uh, we went home and a fresh group of DMORC came in. And we were instructed uh, and trained. And at any of these events, they rarely happen in your backyard. And you're going to be going into um, a new world that we eventually, where the devastation is, that we eventually get to go leave 
go back to our pristine, uninterrupted, uncorrupted area. So they said, you always got to tell, tell the co-workers that you work with that are from the area of the devastation, you know, we have to go home tomorrow. We're done. There'll be new people coming in, and they won't let you down. And they know you won't let them down because we've told them already. And is there anything you want us to do further when we get back to our cushy little worlds? Because we understand you, you're stuck here. This is your home. You can't go away from it. This is it. And you're going to live with this forever and ever and ever. And we get to go back to normalcy somewhat. And you're still here in a very abnormal situation. Is there anything that we can do further when we get home to our environment? And they both said, and then at the same time, because they run different shifts, different timetables, they both said as if they had rehearsed it, which they hadn't, but just tell everybody when you get home, thanks. Isn't that interesting? And um, that helps a heart heal. So thank you from Patrick and Lewis, but he allows us to call him Louie, the detectives. And uh, we invited them to come to Iowa. They'd never been out of Manhattan. They have no, they said we've flown over it, you know, before. I said, well, you gotta come. Here you have nothing but concrete and buildings. You should come. Do you like to hunt? Oh, we love to hunt. And in 10 years, They've stayed right there. They haven't left. They have not even for a visit. <laughs> Pretty cool. I'm, I won't, I, I've retired from this. There's plenty of people, more and more every day. I'm their number one cheerleader, Dean Wart. And, but if something affects our community or our, and someone says, could you help? Of course, how can you not help, right? But I'm not a moth to the flame anymore. The flame's gotta come to me. And that's a big difference, because all of us will do what we can if that happens. It just takes a few people that wanna do this run into the fire. I won't do that again. There I'm selfish. And I don't think selfish is a bad word. It's misused and misunderstood. But I won't be a moth to the flame anymore. Upstairs. But you know, they just sat here forever. <laughs> I should look at these someday. Hi, Abe. Yeah. I can't remember what this is. Oh, it's a coin. Dusty. Freaking museum. One year 